love Georgetown, so I love being at TEDx Georgetown. We are a species on the move. It is estimated that there are 200 million people in the world today living outside their country of origin. How many of you were born outside the United States or have lived outside the United States at least once in your life? Please raise your hand. Many people in the audience. You have been, are, or will be an immigrant at one point in time in your life. I, for example, was born in uh, Madrid, Spain, and became a US citizen by choice in 2006. It was a momentous occasion because I went from those who cannot vote because they're foreigners in the United States to those who cannot vote because they live in Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> At the naturalization ceremony here in D.C. Superior Court, the judge who administered the oath of alliance told us, I remember still, please do not forget the language and the customs of your country of origin because I hope that one day you and your children would teach me and my children those languages and those customs. This we can do with the internet. You may have heard about the difference between digital native and digital immigrant, between those who were born in the age of laptop and mobile devices, and those of us who were born before those technologies had been invented. This is not a talk about that. This is a talk about the immigrants who use the internet to bridge the gap between the country of origin and the host country. This is a talk about the people who use the internet to teach the language and the customs of the country of origin to their kids in their new country about the immigrants who would like to vote online in their home countries but cannot, about the illegal immigrants who evade, sometimes successfully, both the law enforcement officers who are trying to deport them and the criminals who prey on them. This is a talk about those immigrants who long to be able to watch the annual festivities of the small village or town that they left behind many years ago. How about those people who long to use the internet to stay connected with the family members and the friends who they left behind? How about those immigrants who search for uh, specialty foods, ingredients, cooking utensils, drinks, clothing, books, movies, music that are not distributed by multinational corporations worldwide? My 10-year-old daughter, Lucia, likes to do her homework with her cousins, Sandra and Rodrigo. She lives in Washington, D.C. They live in Valladolid, Spain. To do their homework together, they use Skype. They do their homework together. They teach each other English and Spanish. They play games. They fight. They build the family ties that I think are critical uh, for families that are not living in the same country. One of my graduate students, Rizwan Khan, hires a professor in Pakistan to teach Urdu online to his children in Washington, D.C., actually in Northern Virginia. Now, there are many tools and devices that allow us to do these things, things like Skype and Rosetta Stone and many others. But most of these services are still not very good. Pedagogically, they could be improved significantly by linguists and technologists and experts. Economically, some of them are still quite expensive. So business people could do better because the immigrants are the ones who need to get up to speed very quickly with a new language and new customs. And most often, they do not have the time or the money to invest in these technologies. Something very interesting happens when you immigrate to another country. You become very, very hungry, hungry for your own culture. When I was, as a young man in Spain, growing up, I aspired to be a world citizen and to break away from the local culture that surrounded me at the time. So I preferred to drink beer instead of red wine. I ate hamburgers instead of bread with olive oil and tomatoes, much to the chagrin of my cardiologist today. 
I watched US basketball game instead of European soccer game. And I listened to Bruce Springsteen instead of listening to La Macarena. <laughs> then I moved to the United States and something very interesting happened within a few months. My Spanishness, if that is a word anyway, became exacerbated. All of a sudden I became an expert in Rioja red wines from Spain and olive oil. All of a sudden I started watching games from the Real Madrid um, soccer club and was the happiest guy last summer when Spain won the World Cup and went to celebrate uh, to DuPont Circle here, actually in the fountain at DuPont Circle. For the record, however, I still prefer Bruce Sprinting over La Macarena. <laughs> culture is very important, and I think that the internet can help us with our cultural identity. To cook a paella, you need a paella. Paella is not only the name of the quintessential dish, it's also the name of the specialty pan used to cook the paella. It's a shallow pan with handles on both sides. For Spaniards, there is no better delicacy than black hoof ham, jamón de pata negra. Specialty ham, cured for months in the mountains of Spain, obtained from special breed of pig with black hoof, who ro which roam free in the fields and eat only acorns. Venezuelans need to find very special flour to prepare arepa, which is their national dish. Even American overseas long for some of the American products they can plant here, but cannot find in other places. I have a colleague uh, in our campus in Doha, in Qatar. Her name is Dini Jones. Every time she comes to the United States, she goes shopping. She shows for a special type of oatmeal beads that allow her to her homemade cookies in Doha, one of the things she misses most. Now, many of these foods cannot be found in the stores or online in many other countries. So I'm asking the people who import food, export food, produce food, I'm asking the government, uh, who, which tax uh, food items everywhere, uh, to make more money out of us, to consider distributing all of these products uh, much more widely, to consider working uh, in much more international networks, to make sure that those immigrants in other countries can have access to those products that are important to them, and also to expose these products uh, to citizens of the host country who may want to learn more about other cultures. I would very much like to watch some movies, like, for example, Celda 211, Cell 211 from Spain, or Tropa de Elite Deutsch from Brazil. The only way for me to watch these movies is to get on a plane and watch them on local TV in Spain or Brazil. The other option I have is to download them illegally from the internet. But I don't want to do that. I'm a chief information officer at Georgetown <laughs> University. I teach ethics in technology in our Masters of Technology Management program. Not only would it be morally wrong for me to do that, I can only imagine the embarrassment if I were caught by one of the uh, motion picture associations. So I would like to ask, and this is true not, all, not only for films, it's also true for books, adult books, comic books, children books. A friend of mine gave me a very interesting book, lent it to me, called In Vie Chinois. It's a graphic novel in French about the modern history of China. And he gave me just the first book of the series. If I want to read more books in this series, once again, I have to catch a plane, have to go to Brussels or France or some other European country, and buy there and continue to read. So I would like to ask the online retailers, Amazon and many others, to consider partnering with other online retailers in other parts of the world so that they can make this uh, magazine, these books available to us who are ready and willing to pay for them. I would also like to ask companies like Google, for example, and other corporations and nonprofit organizations like the libraries to put more content online. And once again, I want them to make money out of it. For those of us who have been lucky enough to find good jobs in our destination country, we're willing to pay for this, to make this content available to, uh, for us and our family members. But please consider also access to scholarships, particularly for those needy immigrants and their children 
who would like to reconnect with their home culture. This would be part of your business model. But uh, all of these improvements in the technology services and the distribution networks and the web and everything else cannot help us very much unless we solve one fundamental problem. And the problem is to get immigrants to use the internet more. And for that, there are a number of things we have to do. First, make sure that the internet is available to them. To make sure that the internet is affordable and convenient for them to use. But also to make sure that they know how to use the internet. That they have the digital literacy skills that are necessary to use the internet. This problem is particularly acute uh, for those people who are forced to live and yet very fortunate to be alive in refugee camps. Many of us at Georgetown University, including our own president, Jack De Gioia, are working on an initiative to bring computer labs and internet access to provide education in refugee camps in Kenya and Malawi. And we're doing this in cooperation with colleagues from other institutions in the Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities in the United States, and also with the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, which deputy director happens to be our very own Professor Alex Aleinikov. In the 1990s, I helped many refugees in the United States make new lives for them in the St. Louis, Missouri, where I was living. These people, many of them from the Balkans, learn how to use computers. That was the gift that I was able to give to them, teaching them how to use technology. Thanks to the computers, they were able to find jobs. Thanks to the computers, they were able to keep in touch with the people whom they had to leave behind. They were able to connect with them. They were able to keep up with the developments in their home country, however sad those news could have been. And for the people who were behind, the immigrants on the better side of the world were able to offer many things. They were able to offer money. They were able uh, to offer them words, and they were able to offer them hope when they were struggling with freedom, with safety, or with economic distress. The United States is one of the most generous countries in the world, granting political asylum to people who are persecuted in their home country. To build these cases, these asylum cases, there are many students in the United States working in legal clinics. And these students gather the evidence necessary to support the asylum petition. And the way they do this, they use the internet because they cannot travel to many of these dangerous places. They're not welcome there, particularly because they're trying to help somebody who escaped the country. And they use the internet, email and Skype and some other technologies to uh, gather evidence, to find witnesses who are going to support the asylum application. And the reason why they can do this is because they're very mindful of privacy practices and technologies that allow the supporters in the home country to testify without fear of retaliation by the local authorities. Privacy controls and technologies are very, very important also uh, in illegal immigration. On the way north from Guatemala to the United States, there are many illegal immigrants who fall prey to unscrupulous criminals in Mexico. They are raped, they're killed, they're robbed, they're kidnapped. And there are humanitarians in Mexico who are trying to help these people who are risking their lives in the hope of getting a better life in the United States. And one of the ways they do this is by publishing information online about the safest route, about the contact information, about the places where these immigrants can catch a meal or uh, sleep for the night um, in relative safety. But for immigrants worldwide to be able to use these services, they need to know that just by looking at a web page, by doing a search online, by exchanging a few messages, they're not going to be automatically deported because law enforcement may be monitoring those electronic communications. It turns out that it's not true that I cannot vote. I can vote for the primary election here in Washington, D.C. I can vote for president of the United States. I can also vote for local and regional representatives in Madrid. I can vote for the uh, representatives to the Spanish parliament, who in turn will elect the president of Spain. And I can even vote for European election 
uh, representative, European Union representative. To do this, I go to the consulate. I register in person. And I wait home until I get my papers to vote by regular mail. Sometimes the papers arrive after the election is over. Then I file my vote, put it in an envelope, and even mail it through regular mail, which is expensive uh, because it has to be certified, or I take it to the consulate. For me, it's not a big deal. It's only a few trips down the street to Washington Circle with the Spanish consulate. But for my fellow countrymen in rural areas of the United States, of other parts of the world, and for many other immigrants, this is quite an ordeal. An ordeal not worth going through. So this is why I would encourage those governments who are considering electronic voting and electronic government to do this, particularly if they have lots of immigrants living outside of their national territory. These people have the right uh, to voice their opinion and to elect uh, their home governments whenever the laws allow them to do this. But it has to be done with privacy, with information security, and with integrity. One of my team members, senior network engineer Eduardo Simonetti, cannot go back to his home country, Venezuela, because it's very hard for him to find a job there. See, in Venezuela, there's a web page that some employers can check by which you enter the national identity number of a person, and the website will tell you how that person voted in the last referendum, whether they voted for Chavez or against Chavez. This is a very interesting pre-employment screening uh, process, one that will prevent many people from going back to the country or working in any of the nationally owned industries. So I think that it is time. It is time for governments to start helping their citizens, not only when there is a national disaster, but all the time by putting more information and more services online. It is time for some of the corporations to think even more globally about the internet, to go after the nomadic markets of immigrants. It is time for journalists everywhere to start publishing more information online, even, even those um, out of the mainstream um, things, like for example, reporting on the Turkish wrestling competitions, which are important to some of the diaspora of Turkish people all over the world. And it is also important for the citizens everywhere to record and to post online those festivities of the small village and town where they're choosing a new beauty queen or having a special tradition so that immigrants in other, immigrants in other places can watch those programs. There could be a much better internet for the 200 million immigrants in the world and the many more who are joining our ranks. Many of you are going to make the world a better place by working on your nonprofit organizations or through public service. Many of you will do the same by becoming corporate types and entrepreneurs with a mandate to make money. Either way, as you work on your internet businesses, as you work on your websites, your blogs, your video snippets, your social media, please keep in mind the immigrants who use those services. And be also very mindful of information security and privacy to protect those who are most vulnerable on the internet, perhaps because of lack of resources and knowledge, and to ensure that those vulnerable people are not stripped away from their hard-earned money by criminals in Nigeria, Russia, or Atlanta. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pablo. That was just what TED is all about, expanding our horizons, pointing out to new opportunities. I spend a lot of my time thinking about how the internet's evolving and what it could be like. And you've pointed out the need for better security. I was wondering if there are a couple other things that you would love to have the internet become, because we're, we're only a third or a quarter of the way through this internet transformation. What, what else would emigres benefit from having from the internet? There are many people that because of their legal situation will not be able to go back to their home countries for many years. Some of them have the children behind, and this is a legal problem that has to be resolved in a different way. But better communications, very high definition video over the internet can bring those people a little bit closer. 
also for people whose language, uh, first language is not English. You can put much more content on the internet in other languages. It's an effort. And the content you put in English uh, could be closed captioned. Mm -hmm. So that those of us I have been working on this accent for the last 17 years. Still it's hard for me to understand some of the words in the, in the movies and the music. So I'm very thankful whenever there's closed captioning. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Thank you, Michael.